Um, my name is Elijah Baer. I am reader in cardiovascular medicine at St. George's University of London and consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist at St. George's University Hospital, NHS Trust. <music> So um, the role for implantable devices um, really depends on the, on the condition. Uh, there are some general principles, though. Uh, the arrhythmia syndromes tend to affect young people, uh, and therefore we would need a very high threshold for wishing to implant young people with uh, electronic devices because of the potential long-term risks of complications. Um, so the first thing to say is only a small minority of patients with arrhythmia syndromes require these uh, devices and implants. Um, uh, secondly, uh, the uh, approach to risk stratification is very much dependent on the condition. Um, and so, for example, if we look at a condition like the long QT syndrome, which we know very well and we have a lot of data on, we can actually do uh, a certain amount of risk stratification that seems to be effective in determining which patients are at risk. So, for example, we know that uh, young boys are most at risk with the condition um, in the younger age groups and that they, if they're having blackouts or if they have a very prolonged QT interval or both, then they are more likely to require benefit from an ICD implant. Um, and then conversely, in adults, young women um, seem to be at the greatest risk. There seems to be a hormonal shift um, during uh, puberty. Um, but not all women, clearly, with a condition require that sort of protection. Uh, usually it's if they, uh, uh, if they have serious symptoms um, and if they've had uh, a very prolonged QT interval on the ECG uh, or they're failing therapy already, so they've gone on to therapy and they've not succeeded. And in the long QT syndrome, there are other therapies that may hold off the need for an ICD implant, for example, um, uh, sympathetic denervation of the heart. We then move on to a different condition, the uh, Brigada syndrome, where we have a lot less data on risk. Um, and the uh, stratification of risk in Brigada syndrome comes down to whether you've had symptoms or whether you have no symptoms. And unfortunately, most people with Brigada syndrome who die suddenly from the condition don't have warning symptoms. Um, so there is a large unmet gap there in terms of the patients who may need ICD implant to protect them, but we can't predict them so well. Um, so the role for ICD implantation in Brigada syndrome is very clear in somebody who's already had symptoms, but unlike in long QT, where you may be able to predict that somebody is going to be at greater risk in the long term, we have a lot of problems with that in, in Brigada syndrome. Um, so the role for, for ICD implants there is, is, uh, is very difficult at the moment, uh, other than in the patients whom it's very obvious to begin with. So the, the potential advances in Brigada syndrome um, in terms of risk stratification uh, are, revolve around how we can examine the phenotype of the patient more uh, accurately. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is to use the ECG because it's our easiest tool. Um, and there is certain evidence that if you see other features on the ECG, they may indicate higher risk. So if we see um, uh, abnormalities in the QRS complex, fragmentation of the QRS complex, or if we see uh, notching towards the end of the QRS complex in the inferior ECG leads known as early repolarization pattern, then these seem to be associated with an increase in risk um, for cardiac arrest in the asymptomatic patient of around threefold each. And so they may be able to help us in determining whether we wish to uh, implant an ICD in a patient or not who hasn't had symptoms as yet. Um, in the uh, individual, um, uh, we may also consider invasive uh, in, uh, risk stratification, and there's been a long-standing uh, and contentious debate about the role for invasive electrophysiological studies in the risk stratification of Brigada syndrome. And the invasive EP study uh, has always been based around uh, a, uh, an attempt to induce stable ventricular arrhythmias in patients who have existing structural disease, for example, having had a previous myocardial infarction 
Um, it's not particularly designed for interrogating a heart where there isn't serious structural abnormality. Um, so there is, a, there is a, an issue that this may be the wrong tool to be using in Brigada syndrome to begin with, but nonetheless it's been used. Uh, and there are um, uh, data that really strongly support the use of uh, EP studies to induce arrhythmias and predict arrhythmias in patients, and then there's a large body of data that says that that, that isn't a useful predictor whatsoever. Uh, and the most recent um, uh, meta-analysis of these data suggests that there is a marginal benefit in the asymptomatic patient of being able to show uh, induction of arrhythmia from the EP study, um, but it's only marginal. So the predictive value is only small, and therefore you have to really use it very carefully in the right patient to try and see if it will help your uh, management. That's my take on that latest data. Um, but there'll still be a lot of resistance to using it, as well as those people who are great uh, enthusiasts for it. I think really a, a very tempered and very careful use of the tool is probably warranted. And that may be beneficial to our patients as well in the longer term.